Shalom Israel, Most High in Christ, blessed, back at it again, uh, and this time, more specifically, not just going into scriptures on, on like, the table of nations and things like that, like history type, that kind of stuff, I'm in, I'm into all that kind of stuff, I'm into the different names and the etymologies and all that, all that kind of stuff, but what's essential to salvation, what's necessary for your soul, that's what we need in this day and age. So that's why we're going to be getting into the beauty of sobriety. Because that is something that really plagues the world today. Everybody drunk, everybody high, everybody's out their mind. We're going to address that today and we're going to start here in Titus chapter 2. I'm going to start with 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. That's the first requirement. Grave, which means serious temperate meaning having self-control sound in faith in charity and patience the aged women likewise meaning the same way that they be in behavior as becometh holiness not false accusers so that goes into your gossiping and your your uh, making up stories about people not given to much wine teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. Notice how, again, it starts off with sober. To love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Because whenever young women start to go against these things, they're indiscreet, they're not chaste. They're not keepers at home. They're out in the streets. They're not obedient to their husbands. The word of God becomes blasphemed. Verse 6. Young men likewise exhort, meaning encourage one another, to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So again, this leads to people who are blameless. That's why I said they're, gonna, they're not going to have any evil thing to say about us. But it all starts with being sober. Alright? So, this had me, me thinking, right? Why do people use drugs? And I say people like, like I'm not a part of that. I used to deal with these things. But, all praise to the Most High, I've overcome them. So, why do people use drugs? And that's the question posed here on Brainly. That's where I'm at. Why do people use illegal drugs? And I like this answer. There were a few different answers, but this is the uh, top answer for a reason. This is a uh, list amount. And we're going to go through this list and address these problems and how to address them correctly with the scriptures all right the reasons why people use illegal drugs the first reason is peer pressure so let's deal with peer pressure according to the scripture this is the book of exodus chapter 23 and verse 2 thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil don't follow something just because everybody else is doing it Follow the word of the Lord. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Meaning, if something is wrong, don't be afraid to speak against that judgment. But the point I wanted out of this is, don't follow something that everyone else is doing just to be popular. All right? And this is uh, on the flip side of that. All right? Leviticus 5 and 1. And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, so you don't even necessarily have to see it firsthand, but if you know about it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. So, if you know of people doing these things, committing sin in this way, tell somebody, okay? Because if you don't, then you're going to bear that iniquity as well. And that goes against what is pushed today about, oh, snitches get stitches. And yo, don't snitch. You better not snitch. I ain't no snitch. The Bible says snitch. 
tell who needs to know about a certain situation. All right? Don't just not do something because nobody else wants to do it. And don't just do something because everybody else is doing it. Do what God says to do. All right? So uh, let's go back. That's uh, peer pressure. And we're going to deal with a little bit more of that throughout, but we're going to move on down. Verse 2, as an escape from stress or tension. It said as an escape from the problems that we deal with, right? So I'm going to go to Psalms 124, verse 8. It says our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God is our help. God is our escape. Once you know the truth about the world that we live in today, you know that the Lord is going to come back, the earth is going to be refreshed, and it's going to be a lot better than what it is now. That is a huge stress relief to know that our escape is the Lord. The Lord will deliver us. All praise to the Most High for that thing. We don't need drugs for that. Number three, to relieve boredom. The scripture talks about that as well. This is the book of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, in the Apocrypha, chapter 33, verse 27. Send him to labor, that he be not idle, for idleness teacheth much evil. So if you're just sitting around being bored, yeah, you're going to want to do some drugs. You're going to want to do whatever evil thing that your mind comes up with. That's why it says specifically in this verse, do some work. Right? Whether it be your job or... or physical, laborious work, or whether it be work for the Lord. Do something. You can't just sit around being idle because then you're going to turn to evil. Keep your mind occupied. In other words, number four, for experiments, right? So this is out of curiosity is another term for it. All right. Let's get this in Wisdom of Solomon Chapter 4 and verse 12. For the bewitching of naughtiness doth obscure things that are honest, and the wandering of concupiscence doth undermine the simple mind. So, a simple mind will get to wandering, and you'll come up with ideas on how to commit sin. You gotta, you gotta search out everything. You got to figure out this and that, what that feels like, what this is going to do to you. That's what Solomon did. And Solomon regretted it. It wrecked his whole life. So learn from the mistakes of our forefathers. And just in general, learn from the mistakes of others. You may see other people in your lives that do um, things that you see didn't work out well for them. Take note of that and don't follow the same path. Number five, abuse and trauma. So how are we supposed to deal with abuse and trauma? A lot of people turn to drugs, but that's not right though. This is 1 Peter 5 and 7. Casting all your care upon him, meaning God, for he careth for you. So that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to cast all your cares upon God. All right. Pray to God. All right, and he will listen if this verse 8 be sober, be vigilant. All right, so be sober, be aware of what's going on, keep your mind sober, and be vigilant. Let's look up vig vigilant real quick because that might not be a word that we use every day. Vigilant means keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. So be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So here you are trying to keep the commandments of God, trying to stop, let's say, smoking weed. But here come the devil in the form of that brother on the block, like, hey, man, you want to hit this? In the form of one of your female friends 
saying, yeah, hit this blunt right here. Be vigilant because they're going to be out here. The devil is going to be out here trying to get you. But the scripture says to be sober. All that stuff is just suppressing the things that you're dealing with anyway. It's not helping you overcome them. Okay? Abuse and trauma. And then, number six, mental or physical illness. All right? Here we got this in, in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So our bodies are the temple of God. We should be treating our bodies as the temple of God, not putting anything unholy or unclean or unrighteous within or even on it. All right. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. As Christ said, be born again. Because wise in this world is like, I know how to cut down an ounce, split it up, get $250 off of it. You know what I'm saying? They know how to jug people. That's being wise in this world. Wise to do evil, as another scripture say. Become a fool. Forget all that that you learned out in the world so that you may become wise in the laws of God. All right? So specifically, let's get into this weed because weed is used, I should say cannabis, is used as a drug, but it's also used as medicine. So how can you find a balance, right? Well, first of all, the scripture did say be sober-minded, so keep that in mind. All right? Don't use it to get high. Okay? This is uh, the book of Genesis 1, number verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So people like to use this verse and say, You see, brother, God gives the herb. God gives the herb so we can smoke it. But what did this say here? It said, The herb and the fruit God give for meat. You don't smoke meat. You don't put the meat smoke in your lungs. You cook it. You eat it. All right? And meat don't get you high. It's food. <laughs> That's what he means right here when he said, It shall be for meat. It means food. And to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have, give, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So not only for us, but the animals as well. You don't see the animals smoking weed out here. Animals only get high whenever we blow the smoke in their face. Let's be real. A dog don't want to get high. Not until you introduce him and now he's addicted. <laughs> All right. Food. It's talking about food. Now you think you can eat weed. But everybody knows eating weed gets you way higher than just smoking it and again keep that sober mind anything that's going to intoxicate you is bad for you again psalms 104 they use this in the same way he causeth the grass to grow for cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth talking about food there are no nutritional qualities about cannabis only time people ever eat cannabis is to get high off of it all right but cannabis does come with some medicinal qualities that's the truth this is Ciroc in the apocrypha Chapter 38, and I'm going to start with one. Honor a physician with the honor due unto him for the uses which ye may have of him. For the Lord hath created him. So God said, listen to your doctors. All right. For of the most high cometh healing, and he shall receive honor of the king. So 
Understand this part though. Of the most high cometh healing. The doctor is not going to heal you. God is the one that heals you. The skill of the physician shall lift up his head. And in the sight of great men he shall be in admiration. Right? It's a good thing. Doctors are a good thing. The Lord hath created medicines out of the earth. And he that is wise will not abhor them. Right? So God made medicines. God made plants that make medicines. Okay. Was not the water made sweet with wood that the virtue thereof might be known? He's talking about the wonders in nature. And he had given men skill that he might be honored in his marvelous works. So God give abilities to the doctors to give you medicines so that God may be honored. With such that he heal men and taketh away their pains. Right? So God heals men and takes away their pains through the medicines that he made from the earth, from plants, usually. Of such doth the apothecary make a confection, and of his works there is no end, and from his peace over all the earth. My son, in thy sickness be not negligent. So don't just get sick. And now, oh, I don't want to take no medicine because God's going to heal me. God is going to heal you through the medicines. But pray unto the Lord, and he will make thee whole. The Lord is the one who makes you whole. Because you can take all the medicine in the world, but a lot of times, that won't do nothing if you don't pray to the Lord. Leave off from sin, and order thy hands aright, and cleanse thy heart from all wickedness. This is how you're going to be healed. If you leave off from sin and cleanse thy heart from all wickedness, that's how you're going to be healed. And see, the thing is, God knows your heart. God knows your heart. God knows whether you're using a medicine to get high or if you're using it for your health. God knows. He knows the difference because he knows your intentions, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God knows. And he's going to choose whether or not to heal you. This is the book of Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know the heart? Because the heart is actually talking about the mind here. The mind is so powerful that you can trick yourself into believing a lie. You can come up with a lie in your mind and then tell yourself that over and over and over. So much so that you believe it yourself. Right? Like you could be smoking weed. And say. I do this. For. Uh, because I ha I'm in pain. And then you just keep doing that. Until you believe it yourself. Because you've told everybody that so much now. I do this because I get headaches. And now you start to believe it. When you know that you originally just started doing it to get high. Now you're just trying to justify. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So nobody can know the heart besides the Lord. Nobody knows your mind besides the Lord. He knows your mind better than you do. All right. So now... We finally made it down to number seven. History of family drug abuse. Okay. Let's get this in Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven and verse 51. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So we in Israel, we have a family history of turning away from the Lord and refusing the Holy Ghost. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. 
So we have a history of rejecting the law of the Lord. And our fathers even killed the prophets. We have a family history of wickedness. Okay? The book of Psalms 95. And I'm going to start with verse 8. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. So God said, harden not your heart. Remember, it's coming back to your heart. Because that's where it begins. That's where evil and wickedness begins. Is in your heart, in your mind. Our forefathers became stubborn against the Lord. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath they should not enter into my rest. So our fathers didn't receive the promised land because of their wickedness. We have a family history of rejecting and resisting the Holy Ghost. All right, so... That's enough of uh, of this. We we've answered this history of family drug abuse. We have that history in Israel. So what's the answer? All right. This is Matthew three and verse six. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So this actually goes back to um, abuse and trauma as well but confessing our sins and being baptized. Now, I'm not just talking about being dipped in water. Jump down to verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. All right? So, baptizing you with the Holy Ghost is receiving the word of the Lord. This is how. We overcome our history of family drug abuse, and more importantly, our history of family wickedness. All right? And the baptism with fire, he's going to do that to the whole planet. That's how he's going to refresh the planet. With fire, that's how he's coming. That's how he's coming back. I'm trying to prepare you for that so that you will not be destroyed as well. You got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, from there, we've dealt with why people use drugs. Let's get into it a little bit more, because what I want to get into specifically is alcohol, right? Alcohol is a problem with a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be, all right? I'm, I'm going to read this in uh, Ecclesiasticus, or Sirach in the Apocrypha, chapter 31, I'm going to start with 27. Wine is as good as life to a man if it be drunk moderately. So nothing's wrong with wine if you drink it with moderation. And it, we're going to get into uh, that as well uh, as far as other alcohol is concerned. But um, alcohol is a gradual intoxication. A little bit is not going to do much to you. Uh, and you pretty much know when you reach your limit if you're not like doing shots or whatever. If it be drunk moderately. What life is then to a man that is without wine? So Sirach said, that's a miserable existence. <laughs> for it was made to make men glad. That's what wine was made for, to make men glad. Wine measurably drunk and in season, meaning at the right time, bringeth gladness of the heart and cheerfulness of the mind. But wine drunken with excess maketh bitterness of the mind with brawling and quarreling. So... If you get too drunk, you'll start arguing and fighting with people. And it will make your mind bitter. Drunkenness increases the rage of a fool till he offend. It diminishes strength and maketh wounds. <laughs> right? Because you'll uh, get blackout drunk, right? And wake up the next day and you got bruises on. You got a black eye. You don't know how, to, <laughs> you don't know how that happened. Right? Rebuke not thy neighbor at the wine and despise him not in his mirth. Give him no despiteful words, press not upon him 
urging him to drink. So that's when people are like, chug, 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 chug. Don't do that. Don't do that. And there's not really a, a point in, in trying to correct somebody when they're drunk because they're not going to remember it anyway. All right. Um, so let's keep going. So the point of this right here is you can drink wine and strong drink, but with moderation. Just don't overdo it. Uh, this is the book of Deuteronomy um, 14 and verse 26. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice and thine household. Right? So this is specifically talking about buying things at the feast. Or buying things for the feast, rather. And uh, it said wine and strong drink and sheep and oxen are, are good for a feast. Right? It's a good time. This is the book of Matthew 11 and 19. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified for children. Right? So Christ drank wine. And he said, wisdom is justified for children. Like, he said, there's nothing wrong with, with drinking wine. Of course, they lied on him and said, well, he's gluttonous and a wine bibber. He wasn't a, a drunkard, but he drank wine. But there's a time and a place for everything, okay? Leviticus 10 and verse 9. It says, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. So don't drink and then teach the people. Right? Don't drink and then do the service of a priest. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that ye may put a difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. And that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Right? So, don't drink in the congregation. It's one thing to have a, a, a feast, right? To drink at a feast. But, you're sitting there uh, uh, drinking while you're sitting there giving a lesson. That's, that's not right. That's unrighteous. That is unclean, as the scripture may say. All right? Another aspect to this is like parties and stuff like that. People get drunk. People get uh, intoxicated at parties. First Peter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings. Revelings just means uh, excessive drinking that usually leads to like drunken sex banquetings and abominable idolatries abominable idolatries is like your christmas party your halloween party things like that wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you right so especially for people that's coming into the truth and you're not going to their parties anymore they're gonna be like man what's wrong with that guy man what's wrong with that girl why are they not partying with us anymore they think they're better than us that's what they're gonna do because wickedness Always hates righteousness. Always. This is Galatians 5. I'm going to start with verse uh, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God so if you party in all the time you're not going to get the kingdom point blank period if you're drunken you're not going to get the kingdom drink moderately don't drink to get drunk if you're going to drink do it moderately And there's even a, a vow of a Nazarite, which I'm not saying anybody take, but they didn't drink any. They didn't drink any wine at all. But 
Uh, nobody has to do that. And I would actually say um, that to break bread and drink wine is a commandment. Right, so this is the book of 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Right? So, Breaking bread and drinking wine is a commandment to show the New Testament of the Lord and the sacrifice that he laid down for us. So, there's nothing wrong with um, drinking wine. Just don't do it to excess. Do it in moderation. All right? Same with strong drink. That's fine. Just don't drink to excess. All right? So... There's one more aspect of being sober-minded I want to touch on before we leave this topic. It's the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, and verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. He had, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. So, another aspect of being sober-minded is not being asleep, being awake to righteousness, as another scripture says. I got this right here in Ma uh, Micah as well. Micah, chapter 2 and verse 11. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be a, the prophet of this people. And see, that's what he was talking about in Isaiah 29, about the rulers and the seers and the prophets of the people. That would be your pastors today. So, I got this here in Hebrews 13 and verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. That is the drunkenness in your mind, the diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, meaning the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Not with meats, not with you trying to understand the parables and the deep prophecies, but grace works to the keeping of the commandments, the good works, all right? which have not profit with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein, right? You're trying to get deep. You're always trying to get deep and you ain't even got your fringes on. You're trying to get deep and you eating a pork chop, right? That don't help nobody. That don't help nobody. So I'll go ahead and close it out with the book of Romans chapter 12. We're going to start with verse one. I beseech you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it's your reasonable service to give your life to the Lord. Right? Present your body as a living sacrifice. I mean, it's not even your body. It's God's body. So what are you doing to it, trying to put all these different substances into it? It's like what we read in 1 Corinthians 3. All right? It's God's temple. And be not conformed to this world, that's your peer pressure, right? But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how you overcome the problems that you deal with. That's how you put away what family history you have in the past by renewing your mind. You're a different person now. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is his law, statutes, and commandments. That is the law and the testimony. Verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, that is the pride and the diverse and strange doctrines, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Right? 
So with that, I hope you got something from this. Use this whenever you're feeling like uh, going too far with the alcohol or picking up a pill or smoking something or snorting something. All right. Think of this. Think of the scriptures. With that, I say shalom. Most high in Christ bless.